Hello everyone, welcome to the Dam Guru program webinar. We are going to be talking today about how the semantic web is going to affect digital asset management. This is the agenda for today's webinar. Um, we have three different speakers today, so I will start with uh, some brief introductions of all of the speakers. Uh, then we're going to discuss um, different metadata challenges in uh, digital asset management. Uh, we'll go on to an introduction to semantic web concepts. Uh, and then give some concrete examples of how the semantic web can be used to manage digital assets. All of this should take about 45 minutes, um, so that'll leave enough time at the end for some questions and answers. So um, if you would, if uh, you could just type in any questions you might have during our presentation uh, into your question box, we can get to them at the very end. The uh, first presenter will be myself, Damien Hess. I am the Director of Digital Asset Management and Publishing Systems at Avalon Consulting. Um, as the slide says, um, I do a bit of writing on digital asset management issues and speak at different industry events. Uh, I am based in Washington, D.C. And I also spend a good part of my time actually designing different content in digital asset management systems and writing code. Our second presenter will be Tim Strela, who is based in Hamburg, Germany. He is a software architect and a developer at the German dam vendor Digital Collections. And he's been working in DAM since 1997. Uh, he is a uh, pretty well-known figure in the DAM community because he runs a news aggregator site called Planet DAM and writes quite a bit about DAM and other software topics on Twitter and on his blog. The third presenter will be Margaret Warren, who is the owner of Metadata Authoring Systems and the creator of Image Snippets, which is an application for enriching image metadata with linked or semantic data. Uh, Margaret has done quite a bit of work on lightweight ontologies, which she will be talking about uh, during her presentation today. Uh, and her work's been presented at Haystack, Google Labs, and the Lodico Semantic Web meetups, um, and has been described in different research papers uh, and presented at conferences, such as the Conference on Concept Mapping and the AAAI Spring Symposium on Linked Data. I first wanted to start talking about different challenges in managing metadata for digital assets. Uh, and really, I'm trying to set up uh, many of the problems that Semantic Web can help solve. Now, there are a lot of different challenges in managing metadata. Uh, I'm only going to focus on three of them. The problem of handling multiple metadata schemas, multiple vocabularies, and cross-domain interoperability. So starting with the problem of metadata schemas, let's pretend for a moment that I do not have a digital asset management system or even a database. Uh, let's pretend I need to track all of my information on my digital assets simply in a spreadsheet. So the first thing I need to do is really decide, well, what am I going to record in the spreadsheet? What are the columns going to be? So in this case, I've decided I'll track the file name, the size, the description, the MIME type, and who created the asset. So in essence, I've just created my metadata schema. My schema defines exactly what I'm going to collect, how I'm going to describe my digital assets. And right now, it only consists of five different fields. Um, and everything seems pretty good. I can enter in information on a couple of different images. But then I discover I have a QuickTime video. And I realize, huh, I would really like to be able to record, say, the frame rate or how long the video is. And I don't have uh, any fields for that in my spreadsheet. So I end up having to stick two more columns into my spreadsheet just to accommodate that video-only uh, metadata. And then, of course, I discover that I have PDFs. And there's some other information that's specific to PDFs that uh, I would also like to record, such as whether it conforms to a pre-pressed uh, vendor standard like PDFX1A or the version of PDF. So then I have to add those extra columns to my spreadsheet. And then I find that I have EPUBs, and that has its own metadata that I want to track. So you can really see where this is heading. It seems like every time I find a new asset type, I need to add more and more columns to my spreadsheet. And you can imagine that after a few hundred or a few thousand assets, I'm going to have a spreadsheet with a lot of columns. And most of those columns are going to be pretty empty because the information only applies to certain types of assets. So what this is really illustrating is that it's, it's really hard to manage all of your digital assets 
uh, in a single spreadsheet, obviously, but also with a single metadata schema. Um, one metadata schema doesn't really fit all of my assets. And so for basically every asset type I discover, I really need a nice, concise, compact schema to describe that. And the problem is that there are a lot of different asset types that I might encounter because my schemas or my asset types are really driven by how I use the assets. So for example, even if I only are working, am working with images, um, the metadata I would like to collect for, say, a portrait or an event photo is going to be quite different. Uh, or if I'm doing image, uh, images for recipes or hotel guest rooms or product images, these will all have very different metadata requirements and thus different metadata schemas that I need to develop. And handling all of these different schemas is hard because one, it takes a lot of effort to develop the schema and then maintain it. And two, it's, it's hard to find, build, or configure systems that can handle such varied uh, metadata for different asset types. So this starts to bring me to a second problem, which is not just multiple schemas, but multiple vocabularies. And schemas and vocabularies are related because the metadata schema is what's defining the fields that I'm going to collect. And the vocabulary defines the values that can go into those fields. And it can be quite difficult to decide what that vocabulary should be. To give you a concrete example, let's assume I had this image. Uh, and my metadata schema says that I can have keywords. So what words should I use to describe this image? Should I call this uh, rabbits or should I use the word bunnies? Um, and it, it really kind of matters because if I allow some people to enter rabbits and other people to, add, to enter bunnies, it'll become very hard for me to get consistent search results. So I, I think most people would decide to use the word rabbits because that seems more formal. And then I can actually develop a taxonomy that says that rabbits is the preferred term, don't use the word bunny, and, and that helps me get more consistent data and a better search result experience. And in fact, this image did come from the New York Public Library, um, and it did come with some metadata from the library, and they do in fact use the word uh, rabbits to describe this image, and that's good. That means that their vocabulary uh, is really agreeing with my own vocabulary. However, if I had gotten this image from another source, like uh, the American Rabbit Breeders Association, I can pretty much guarantee they would not have labeled this as being a picture of rabbits, because that's just too general of a term for them. Uh, they probably would have used a term like English lops to describe the breed of the rabbit. And if I had gotten this image from the Natural History Museum, I probably would have gotten the scientific name for the European rabbit. So what's often happening is here is that I have multiple vocabularies to describe uh, this image. Uh, the vocabularies are really being developed by different communities to suit different purposes. You know, one is a more general interest vocabulary, another one is designed for hobbyists or enthusiasts of rabbits, and another one is, is really created for a scientific community. And this poses some challenges for me because in many ways, I would like to use terms from all of these vocabularies. Um, you know, if I get a term from the ARBA, the American Rabbit Breeders Association, saying that this is English lops, it would be really nice if I could use that metadata because it would save me the effort of having to tag all of these images myself. Um, and second, uh, if I get that term English lops, you know, that's actually valuable. If I simply code this image as being a picture of rabbits, then if later I do want to know, you know, do I have any English lop-eared rabbit pictures, it would be harder for me to find. So in an ideal world, I would love to use all of these vocabularies, but that throws me back into the original rabbits versus bunnies problem in that I have so many different terms in use, how do I find anything, and how do I avoid that chaos of so many different terms being used? Which really brings me to the third problem I wanted to talk about, which was cross-domain interoperability. Really, the problem of multiple vocabularies um, is a subset of this cross-domain problem. Uh, in terms of the vocabularies, I would like to find a way to get all of these vocabularies to work together. Um, but there are many other types of uh, interoperable problems that I face, and that's because assets no longer exist 
in isolation. Uh, any digital asset you have really exists or has a very complex web of relationships. So to explain that a little more concretely, let's assume I have one image and I have a lot of good metadata about that image. I've got its description, I've got keywords, I have information on its size and resolution. But all of that information isn't the only metadata I need to be able to use that asset effectively. There are many related entities that have information that I need in order to process and use this image. So for example, I know that my image will have a photographer. And I would very much like to be able to get that photographer's name and contact information. That image may also be of a product, and when I'm searching for the image, I may want to be able to search for product information to display the image that's related to it. Um, I probably have permissions information that tells me how I can use the image. I may have uh, user reviews written about the image, and when I'm displaying the image online, I may want to be able to find those reviews and display those as well. Um, and the image might be part of a marketing campaign, or it may have sales information tied to it that I would like to be able to access so that I can judge the effectiveness or the value of the image. And of course, all of this different information is stored in different systems. And all these systems will, as we've been discussing, have their own metadata schemas, as well as their own vocabularies to describe all of this metadata. And yet, I would like some way to pull all of this metadata together so I can use it to process my images uh, seamlessly and get value from them. So in a nutshell, this is what we're looking for. We, we want to find a way to allow varied metadata schemas to accommodate multiple vocabularies and to share metadata across many different domains and systems. And it just so happens that the semantic web was developed to address all of these points and make, uh, make it possible. And so for the next section of our webinar, uh, Tim Strela is going to give you an introduction to different semantic web uh, concepts and topics. Thank you, Damien. Yeah, let's talk about the semantic web. The World Wide Web that we're all using has been a huge success, of course. We can gather information from all kinds of sources in such a fast and playful way that we call it surfing, even. But web surfing is for humans only. It doesn't really work well for software, at least yet. That's because the HTML source code of a web page is just text with no machine-readable meaning, even though most websites are powered by a database or XML files in the backend. A fancy word for meaning is semantic. So the semantic web was about putting structured and machine-readable information out on the web so that software can understand its meaning. Existing data formats like uh, SQL, CSV, or plain XML weren't that well suited for the web, so a few new technologies were invented at the time. RDF for representing data, Sparkle as a query language for RDF data, and OWL or OWL for representing ontologies. There was an initial semantic web or Web 3.0 hype, but then interest in the semantic web waned. But people kept working on public data sets like DBpedia or GeoNames or Wikidata. And more recently, the search engine giants, Google, Bing, and Yandex, started investing in structured data on the web with their common schema.org initiative. So the semantic web is sort of coming back, even if it's now often called linked data instead. RDF really is at the heart of the semantic web. It's an abstract data model and very flexible. Abstract data model means um, your application data model in a digital asset management system, that data model might consist of assets, metadata, files, users, permissions, and so on. You can express your kind of data model in RDF. Because it's very flexible, Adobe chose RDF as the basis for XMP, their extensible metadata platform. So you're probably already using RDF. RDF seems pretty primitive. 
All information is broken down into RDF statements, which, like a simple sentence, have just a subject, a predicate, and an object. Such a three-part statement is called a triple. Each part is identified by a URI. A URI is usually just a URL, as you know it from browsing the web, but URI is the more exact term, so well, let's go with that. It's pretty easy to make up RDF triples. So, for example, the recording of this webinar is about DAM. Would be such a triple if you used three URIs. One for the webinar recording, one for the is about relation, and a third URI for digital asset management. In RDF, you can say pretty much anything about anything as long as you're using URIs. And this looks like it could solve the multiple metadata schema problem demonstrated by Demian. So how does that help us in our digital asset management systems? Let's make up an example. Say you want to ingest the recording of this webinar into your own DAM system. And you're lucky. You don't even have to do the keywording yourself. A colleague from Japan already has that same asset in her DAM. And she's kind enough to send over her metadata record. But looking at the record she sent, you feel a bit lost. Almost everything's in Japanese, which I assume you don't understand. So now you can empathize with non-interoperable software. If software had feelings, it would feel just as lost when coming across data it doesn't understand. So let's ask her to make that record interoperable. First, she's replacing her damn system numeric asset ID, the 4353 and so on thing you see at the top, with a URI that identifies the webinar recording. Now you're sure you're both talking about the same asset. Next, she's starting to annotate the metadata fields with URIs. Those cryptic Japanese field names just mean name, date published, and about. She's using schema.org field names here. Now that you understand the structure of the record, you can map it to the metadata fields in your own DAM system. Lastly, she's adding URIs to the terms to the metadata values on the right side. In this case, she's using URLs from the Wikidata side. You can see that these URLs alone aren't enough to understand what's being referred to. You see they've got codes in them, Q1224694, and you so far have no idea what they're meaning. But because they're URLs, we can look them up. And it's pretty cool that a record doesn't need to include an English name for the terms. It can simply point to a place on the web where more information is available. Now looking this up, this is what we see. It's a Wikidata web page in a web browser. And we see that the record points to the topic of digital asset management. To make things perfect, a Japanese colleague now even sends the record as RDF. There's various notations for RDF data, including text and JSON formats, which he's using RDF in XML here. I think it looks pretty, pretty okay and pretty clear. Um, you'll find a link to a slightly more complex example in the comments section on the webinar page. Now to recap, we made this data interoperable by first identifying the asset with a URI. If you want to do this in your DAM system, that should be relatively easy to do. You just need to make up a kind of syntax for turning the asset IDs you already have into URIs. Maybe you use a domain name of yours, and some kind of prefix. In the beginning, these don't have to be working URLs. It's okay to have them return an error message. Um, it's mainly there for establishing a globally unique identifier for every asset, so that you and others can start talking about it. But the URIs you're making up should be built in a way that you can turn them into a working URL later, because later that URL should return the asset structured metadata. So number two, we specified URIs for the metadata fields. In this case, please don't make up your own URIs for the fields. Rather, check out public schemas like schema.org or Dublin Core and use their URIs wherever possible. And 
three, we used URIs from public vocabularies for the metadata values, for the terms. And this is really hard to do after the fact. It's going to involve a lot of manual labor to clearly define the semantics of your existing data afterwards. So you're only going to do this when it really seems worth the effort. But you should keep this in mind when you're starting with something new. So the next time you need, say, a list of country names, make sure to get them from the public data set, which provides a URI for each country. And then make sure to annotate the country in your DEM system's metadata storage with that URI so you don't lose it. Number four seems much easier. I think your DAM vendor or integrator should be able to produce RDF or JSON-LD output from your DAM data in less than a week. So all in all, quite a lot of work. And for what? Well, in the short term, there are cheaper ways to achieve interoperability with a few other systems you care about today. But I'm sure that at least a part of the DAM market will have to focus much more on broad interoperability in the future. They need to open up their DEM data to systems you haven't even heard of. We've seen a couple um, before in Demian's slides. And there's really much more, a lot of more systems you want to connect to. And your DAM system needs to provide interoperability in a standard way. Your homegrown API is cool, but integrators don't want to learn a new API for each system they're connecting to. I'm sure you heard people complain about silos, data silos, but actually silos don't hurt that much if they're well connected. If you think of it, that's exactly what the web is. It's a million website silos, which you can surf pretty easily because you've got links and search engines. I think at least the larger DAM customers will have custom portals that provide, provide a unified view of DAM and PIM and CRM data, product information management, customer relation management. They want to see all of them in a single interface. So your DAM system is probably going to move a bit into the background, but it'll feed its data everywhere. And again, I think we need to do this in a standard way for this to really work. So within our global DAM community, Let's start a discussion on how to do linked data in them, and let's start working on a standard together. I think it doesn't really have to be complicated. And of course, we're all going to benefit. So please, let us know your thoughts in the comments section after the webinar, and keep the discussion going, and let's make it real. So much for the theory. And now I'm handing the microphone over to Margaret, who can finally show us some screenshots. Okay, thank you to everyone before me. I'd like to uh, talk about some um, screenshots from an application that illustrates some of the concepts that uh, Tim and Demian have been talking about. Mixing vocabularies, reusing schemas, and cross-domain interoperability. Finding and choosing identifiers or entities is sometimes challenging uh, because it's, it's difficult to find any one vocabulary that satisfies all needs. But here is an example of where the public vocabularies and some user-created data sets are being used side by side. Um, we have um, here, DBpedia and Yago, Wikidata, and uh, the Art and Architecture Thesaurus. And um, you can also see over, although it's maybe a little small, but uh, some user-created data sets such as online comic characters or Porsche-1, which is a, a, domain, a, a specialty vocabulary created about um, vintage Porsche automobiles and their parts. And something you're not going to find too much of, you'll find only the surface level information in DBpedia. So um, because of the things that Tim was talking about related to uh, being able to publish in RDF, which is a common syntax, then um, all of these uh, data sets can be used side by side. And uh, we're going to see some examples of how that 
of how that works. Here, what we're seeing is being able to build a triple, as Tim was describing. So we're referring to this image, which is the subject of that triple. So here is the JPEG uh, name. And what you're looking at underneath the image is a uh, RDF um, expression for the triple. So we have the URI that is the the subject, which is the JPEG image itself. Then we have the property, which is relating the uh, what the object is to the subject. And um, so what we're seeing here is the ability to choose from from a variety of the data sets. We have a DBpedia description of hummingbird, which you can read here is the birds that comprise the family of of the uh, I'm sure I would pronounce that wrong um, but uh, the um, uh, this is the generic um, definition of hummingbird but you can see that uh, public data sets have matured over the years to be quite complete and can satisfy some domain experts in a number of domains um, so this slide illustrates the most often chosen terms over time and that, in our experience, agreement has evolved. Um, but the agreement between the terms is not absolutely necessary as the software can align the data. Um, so the ruby-throated hummingbird in the Yago is actually essentially the same as the DBpedia entity. And in this case, DBpedia would be a preferential choice for annotators because it will provide some reasoning, as you'll see um, at the end of this, um, these slides. Okay, and the look up here also indicates that, uh, that there are even greater choices available if a user could not find what they were, actual, what they were looking for in the first list here you can see that um, there are bands, songs, a photo processing chain, the humming photo bird, pho hummingbird photo processing. Uh, there are bands, songs, and some places and geo names, so on. So vocabularies, public vocabularies do provide a great deal of, uh, of entities already and have become quite mature. Uh, each vocabulary has entities they are better at describing, but they can all be used with which to build triples um, without conflict. So here are the triples that were created from the previous example. So there was other information which was added in this that uh, was not shown, but you can see that uh, we're using multiple schemas such as Dublin Core and the XMP and the IPTC. These are some well-known schemas. And uh, of course, other triples can be added uh, using properties for many other types of triple from in many other types of schemas and can be published all together. Okay, so now we're going to look at this use of the triples for describing relationships that to get a little bit more expressive uh, in, uh, in our annotations. So I'm going to uh, start look at another quick example of disambiguation, which is where we're disambiguating between uh, the cardinal, the bird, versus, say, the St. Louis Cardinals. Of course, if I had done the lookup, um, there would have been even more choices, such as you know a Catholic prominent Catholic bishop or a number of elements in a set or a color or have you. But mostly, I wanted us uh, to look at this slide to note that in this image, what we have is an actual cardinal, the bird, and there's no question that this depicts the actual bird. If we were describing it using schema.org, which we could do, this would be the thing that the image object was about. So the DBpedia cardinal would be the thing that the image was about. And or if we were using something like FOAF, which is another um, 
a widely used uh, vocabulary of relations. It would be a depiction of a cardinal. So, but if we go to our next image here, this is a little bit more difficult. Uh, you know, a skilled annotator would probably not use the keyword cardinal with this image, but this image did come with these keywords. Uh, so, and you can see it's a difficult image to annotate. Uh, there would be, there's, there's no bridge, there's not much kayak, the water is difficult to see, and there's definitely no real cardinal. But, uh, so it's compared with the other cardinal, it's a very different cardinal. So because we can use triples to try to say more about images, or we can build these little sentences that with the subject and the property and the object, we can actually create some uh, other ontologies of relations that can help us say a little bit more. And there are many of them out there that can describe whether a keyword is a place or an event or something like that. But I've been working with a deliberately small ontology of properties called the Lightweight Image Ontology uh, to see what we can do for image description using a little bit of semantics. The idea is that a little bit of semantics can, can go a long way. So uh, the Lightweight Image Ontology is essentially 11 terms that can be used to connect the keywords to a subject with a descriptive relationship. And uh, it's very small, it's 11 terms, and they can be used as a kind of a light, of a, of a linked data glue, so to speak. And this uh, lightweight image ontology is discoverable and on, in the linked data world uh, through the Linking Open Vocabularies website, and it's, it's just, and it's published as RDF. So looking back at our uh, Catholic University mascot, the Cardinal, uh, the Leo vocabulary has a property called uses pictorially. It has a few other properties which are interesting, such as has setting and has in the foreground. And I'm not going to go over every one of the terms in this webinar, but uh, they, you can find them in the um, ontology that's published. So uh, in this case, what we're doing is building a triple to say that the cardinal is something that's seen more pictorially. It's not a real cardinal. And we use this term, uses pictorially, um, to represent objects that differ from ordinary depiction, that, that are maybe used in an artistic or pictorial way. It sounds more complicated to use than it actually is. We found that many users pick up on this right away. We also, um, uh, are relating this time not just to the image but to a region in the image and there are a number of linked data vocabularies that can refer to, to regions such as media fragments uh, which is also av available to look up. Uh, there's also the image interoperability framework that is doing a lot of work with this. In this case we uh, this is just using simple SVG coordinates Okay, so now that we have looked at a small example of using something with the vocabulary Leo and uh, some other terms, we're going to see how this can improve uh, the search functionality by the disambiguation of keywords, the uh, mixing of open vocabularies, and um, how we can, using something like Leo can have more expressive relationships, and uh, how machine reasoning can uh, get, do a lot as well with the structured data. So when we use these open vocabularies, like DBpedia, uh, it can come along with some reasoning, <laughs> sort of comes for free, as we say. And uh, so, for example, DBpedia knows that an anhinga is a bird. It's a subclass of under birds. So therefore, uh, this image, which was, uh, which has the triple created, this image depicts Anhinga, uh, 
will return, will come back in a search for birds without needing an explicit text string for the word bird. So this is very powerful. It, uh, there's a lot that can be done with this subclass reasoning that doesn't, so that vocabularies don't have to have all of these terms defined in them because the public vocabularies can do a lot. Okay, so Sparkle queries can return results from mo multiple vocabularies. I'm doing here a search for snow, and the software can combine all of the different vocabularies. So as you can see here, we've got uh, entities being returned from the data set Yago, from DBpedia, and from the Art and Architecture Thesaurus. Uh, it was interesting to note that there are some subtle distinctions in the vocabulary. So DBpedia just refers to snow is the precipitation in the form of flakes of crystalline water ice that falls from the clouds, but Yago uh, says that you can have a layer of snowflakes that's covering the ground, or um, it also says that you can have um, uh, precipitation falling from the clouds. So in our experience, we uh, were uh, surprised to see that being able to have the different vocabularies allowed the annotators to make some subtle distinctions that became useful because they were able to uh, make distinctions between falling snow versus snow that was on the ground. Okay, so now uh, seeing a little bit of the lightweight image ontology being used for sorting uh, these results, uh, here you can see the what was returned for a search on cardinal, the bird, and here is our picture that we annotated earlier of the uh, actual cardinal itself, which is being depicted, and uh, in here a cardinal is being shown. Don't worry, this, this cardinal did get free from my cat, <laughs> but, uh, the card, but um, I will explain the, uh, the relationship shows in just a moment, and uh, uses pictorially uh, here, you can see, um, was returned in such a way that the vocabulary, the Leo vocabulary, was able to sort the results um, and, sort, and, and, and sort out the noise, so to speak, from these, what would normally be just the keyword cardinal. And uh, here we have snow. The search for the search for snow, and we can see that this has snow in the background. We could say that this is using snow pictorially in a pictorially pictorial way, and um, here an interesting uh, result that the gypsum looks like snow. When we put these together, we could combine these terms as well using Sparkle, and. Uh, so we can combine both the bird search and the snow search, and we can see here that we have now been able to sort out a picture of snow that is depicted, because this picture actually primarily has snow in it. A bird is shown in the image, and uh, shows refers to objects that are less important in the images. So whereas depicts is the primary object of the image, shows is something that is uh, perhaps uh, in the picture but not quite so, uh, might not quite the main thing that the image is about. So uh, we see that here that, that the bird is clearly depicted and the, sh the snow was just shown. There was there's a little bit of snow in there, but it wasn't the primary thing in the image. And then the usefulness of discovering uh, the images that have a depicted background of snow with a bird in the picture. And so depicted background refers to objects that fill the entire background of a scene. So this really shows all of these uh, screenshots show the value and the way that in fact, vocabularies can be mixed, and because everything is done with RDF, and because Sparkle queries can do a lot of the heavy lifting, 
that you can um, combine uh, ontologies that can give you a little bit more expressivity, that you can combine schemas, and uh, you can um, use the semantic web to change the way that uh, that uh, images are annotated and uh, how things are published. Thanks very much, Margaret. I see one question that came in that said, uh, why do you think the semantic web didn't catch on initially? And Tim, I bet you have some perspectives on that. Oh, that's really a good question. Um, I think there were two problems um, initially with, with the semantic web. One was that um, maybe the, the vision, the original vision was a bit too grand, or it sounded too grand, having a, a really global ontology for say, topics like e-commerce or even um, describing images or digital assets um, across possibly thousands or tens of thousands of different websites, different information providers. Um, I think there was a bit, a bit too much to aim for and um, we in uh, every one of us working in Dan knows how hard it is even in-house within our own organization to um, get everybody to use the same vocabulary and to actually mean the same thing when using the same terms and um, to make this work on a, on a global scale um, that, that's really hard and I, I think it the perfect end result can can really never be achieved. You won't get perfect globally used semantics um, on any kind of topic. So that was was really one one problem, and I think we we just piled a bit back on this. And the other thing was that RDF and and its um, flexible data model were really a bit too too hard to implement with the technology available back then. Um, now we have. Um, triple stores, graph databases, and so on, which make it much easier to, to implement this data model, but that was hard back in the day. Yeah, I was thinking that a big problem was that it was a great in concept, but hard to actually implement in a way that would be, um, you know, could perform well, but I have seen that there are a lot of different technologies now that make it possible. And, and I agree, there's, I think, more of a critical mass now. Uh, there are more uh, available ontologies and vocabularies. Uh, like DBpedia and what uh, schema.org is working on. So I think that's going to probably lead to a lot more adoption of, uh, of this uh, technology now. I see another question is, um, could the semantic web be the basis for connecting different DAM systems? And I, I certainly think myself that that, that is um, what the semantic web could, could very easily do, especially since uh, part of the standard for triple stores, these semantic databases, is that they support Sparkle. And Sparkle, as a query language, is really designed to work across different uh, repositories or across different databases. Um, Tim or Margaret, have you seen um, like evidence that semantic uh, DAM systems are going to start getting linked together? I'd be really interested in, in, in hearing about the use cases. This, I mean, there's this really lots of large organizations with multiple DAM systems, um, but um, most of the use cases I've seen were, were really rather about connecting DAM systems to, um, to other systems um, like product information management or uh, web content management. Um, but either way, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure this would work great um, because um, while some things are, are hard to implement, um, at least the first steps are, are rather easy. The data format in XML or JSON is pretty easy to implement, and I think this, this should work really great. And, and I know some of the clients that my company has been working for, which are large media and entertainment companies, they, they often have multiple dams uh, inside the enterprise, and we, we have been working on creating these shared metadata hubs based on um, semantic technologies to be able to really aggregate all of this uh, different information in the different dams so that you can have a more unified search experience across all of the different dam systems. See, another question we've got is, uh, do any dams support multiple metadata schemas? If not, how would you make this work in a dam? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's, 
<laughs> this is a good question. Um, I mean, this is getting down to that nitty gritty of uh, you, you know specific functionality for for different dams. Um, I, I, I've certainly worked with dams that can support multiple uh, schemas, um, but uh, I'm always open to different suggestions people have, <laughs> like Tim or Margaret. Like if if your dam only supports a single schema, do you have any tips or tricks that you know could make things uh, work better? Good question. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, ba basically, if if you're stuck with a single schema, um, you know, you really have to work very hard on your metadata model and come up with a good generalized model. Um, I, I I don't have a better suggestion than than that at this point. Or you start looking at moving your metadata out of the dam and you, you put it in something like a semantic database and you're linking to your digital assets. Right. I, I think that, uh, you know, some uh, digital asset management systems could be, uh, still be the back end, you know, as Tim was mentioning. And then uh, it, it all depends, you know, on how much of this is going to be published versus data that you need to use in-house and the usefulness of needing to use the metadata schemas that link out to the rest of the world. And um, of course, you know, um, in my experience, you know, I am using multiple metadata schemas. And um, what's interesting is that you have people, um, uh, you know, we're looking at now uh, different schemas beginning to uh, get more adoption than others. And so the schemas that might have worked internally uh, 10 years ago uh, are being revised and revamped. And um, for example, I mean, IPTC has been around for a long time and it's merged with XMP and uh, over the years and then of course we have Dublin Core and you know all of those schemas are really being used a, a lot by a lot of different people all of the time so and they don't with linked data the beauty is is that they don't have to stop being used you, know, they, you don't necessarily have to have a standard although I know some people will probably um, um, you know want to discuss that a, a lot more, but um, um, I don't know if this is sort of answering the question, but I think that, um, I don't know, I think maybe I'll defer back to, to Tim or to, on this. I think maybe, yeah. You, you know, one, one thing I was going to say, Tim, maybe even weigh on this too, it seems that if all of your metadata is not within the dam, because the dam may not be able to accommodate it, it, it seems like a really key thing is to have uh, persistent unique identifiers um, because if you've assigned an identifier to that asset you can put metadata about that asset in other systems and still then retrieve it again you can link it all together that, that's really seems key to me for any um, kind of uh, approach yeah yeah that's true <coughs> um, just just one thing well I'm, I'm pretty sure this um, there's a couple of advanced dam systems out there um, which do support multiple metadata schemas, but also you can, well, as a first and very very simple approach, you can simply document um, just in in prose um, which public schemas your metadata fields are um, referring to, and w then when you do an RDF export something like that, then you just um, use those URIs um, for your export. Doesn't have to be directly within the dam in, in the first step. Exactly. I see our next question. If we have schema.org, Dublin Core, and the others, how is this a standard? Well, I think what is the standard is RDF. And so we have these entities that are created, and we have different property relationships. We have the property relationships in schema.org. We have uh, the schemas from Dublin Core for, say, uh, that have been around a long time, and the IPTC. And I think they can all be used. And uh, this is, is the big point about the interoperability about linked data, is that everything is being published as RDF. And so, um, any type of semantically aware machine that's looking at data 
is going to be able to see all this data. So I think it, it you know, we have there's a lot of flexibility in organizations being able to adopt whatever they would like to adopt, uh, and um, you know that the that the RDF is the standard, if that makes sense. Right. Or you make assertions uh, using RDF to really do that crosswalk, to do the mapping, to say yes. that um, this concept in this vocabulary is equivalent to or is a sub-property of or a subclass of this other concept that's in another well-known vocabulary. And that starts to give you that, that interlinking that uh, then semantic you know, inference engines can automatically reason across and recognize the interrelationship between the different terms. Yes, the way we found uh, all of the different variations of snow right. in the example that I showed. For, you know, that, so there were like five different versions of the word snow, but the software did the heavy work of, of finding all of those, uh, those and mapping them together. But you know, was it didn't depend on a on a human person, you know, to they could they could be done with the structured data. Uh, this is a really great question because it it really points to a problem with the semantic web thing, and we we have to acknowledge this. Um, I mean, in, in RDF you can express any kind of data model, and then you have tons of public vocabularies and tons of public schemas, and of course you can get totally lost. Um, say, if, if each of us starts implementing linked data within their dam system, um, odds are pretty pretty high that we're all doing it differently, and then it's, it gets hard to interoperate. So, um, so it should be our goal within, within the dam community to actually do things the same way. And at the moment, I'm, I'm really not an expert, but I think schema.org would be a good start. Um, on my, on my blog, you'll find an example of schema.org markup for, for them, and it seems to work pretty well. But yeah, if, if we're all doing it differently, then things will will, will be hard. Well, not, ne not necessarily, I mean, because it's all published as RDF. So if you, I think um, there was an interesting uh, presentation that I wanted to direct people to, and I didn't have a chance to put it in the slide. but. Um, uh, there's a uh, well-known uh, creator from at the beginning of the semantic web days, uh, Jim Hendler, who talks about using small these small ontologies to glue the semantic web together, and that uh, they can start to do a lot of that work of relating these concepts back and forth to each other, and and using a little bit more expressivity. Um, for example, like what is being done with Leo. To uh, to sort out, say the keywords, for example, and so that you get a little bit more. You can say a little bit more uh, just by using a small number of terms. And again, because that ontology is published, then any semantically aware machine can read that. Um, I see that we have another question about: Can we explain again what a triple is? I think we can just describe it. So a, a triple in RDF is really made up of three parts. For every um, statement that you're going to make using RDF, you can say there's a subject, a predicate, and an object. So you might have a picture. The picture is a subject, and the predicate may be depicts, uh, and the object might be a bird. So that makes three parts, and so they traditionally will simply call a statement in RDF a triple. Um, you know, we are coming up on the top of the hour, so I'm thinking that uh, we should just uh, end the webinar here, but there's been a lot of uh, questions and interesting uh, conversations, so I, I would encourage everyone, I think there's a comment section that people can leave questions or comments or follow up with any one of the speakers. We've got their contact information on the screen, and hopefully we'll be doing some more webinars in the future to dive more deeply into each of these areas that we were talking about today. So thanks everyone for joining.